Welcome to chapter 4 of Richard Flanagan's Toxic, where the thematic goes back to the erratic. While I'm going to again correct some of the inaccuracies that Flanagan cites, I am going to go a little bit off-piste in this chapter and going to delve into Richard's approach to his wider writing. I mean, if a Booker Prize winning author of fiction is also apparently an expert on aquaculture science, then this humble aquaculture educator can have a go at being an expert on literature. I was once an English teacher in a galaxy long, long ago. As a fiction writer, Flanagan is aware of the power of literary tropes. He uses them throughout this latest work. Central to his theme is the trope of the gallant rebels against the evil empire. So if Richard and his followers are against salmon farming for a range of reasons, for this trope to work, salmon farming and the systems which governs it must essentially be evil. But the trouble with the evil empire trope is that it exposes the author's true stance. It only works if the empire meets its downfall, if it's destroyed entirely. So the move farm onto land arguments are merely deflections and feints to take the enemy's eye off the main objective, the complete destruction of the salmon industry in Tasmania. Another literary trope that Richard uses throughout this work, and one which we'll unpack a little bit later, is the use of hyperbole the use of extreme exaggeration to make a point. E.g. this sun in the, my eyes is blinding me or the wind in these trees is deafening me. But the thing about hyperbole is that it's not meant to be taken literally and is only effective when the audience understands this. The intended effect of hyperbole is not to deceive the reader. And here is where the talents of Flanagan come through to the fore. He's using hyperbole in the knowledge that the readers of his book are in the main not familiar with salmon farming, cleverly turning hyperbole back on itself, with the clear intent to encourage the reader that these examples are not exaggerations, but the literal truth. So let's look at some examples today. We'll start with stocking density. Richard uses the hyperbole, saying that Tasmanian salmon is the battery hen of the sea. Now, the informed reader knows that this is an exaggeration, Salmon are stocked at 8 to 10 kilograms per metre cubed, about 1% fish to 99% water. This glass jar is one litre. The 10 grams of pebbles in the bottom illustrate the stocking density of Tasmanian salmon. 10 grams of pebbles to one litre of jar. But the uninformed reader doesn't realise that the battery hen analogy is hyperbole and is tricked into believing it's true. So let's look at this in some more detail. So stocking density is a measure of the amount of weight of a farmed animal that you can put into a defined area of space. Now that might be a flat space or it might be a three dimensional space like a fish tank or a fish cage. So let's examine the allegation that uh, salmon are battery hens of the sea. So the RSPCA salmon standard says that stocking density must not exceed 15 kilograms per metres cubed, which means 15 kilograms of fish in 1,000 litres of water. Now, I've already explained how the stocking density of uh, Tasmanian salmon is generally around 8 to 10 cubic metres. So down here at the bottom of the screen, we have two Atlantic salmon, around 6 kilos, 12 kilos of fish, in a cube of 1,000 litres of water. So let's compare that to the RSPCA poultry standard, which says for meat chickens with natural ventilation that you can have 28 kilograms of chicken per square metre. Now they don't measure cubic metres because chickens don't swim nor do they fly. So that's 28 kilograms of chicken per every square metre. If they've got mechanical ventilation, that can be up to 34 kilograms of chicken for every square metre. But Richard doesn't compare us to meat chickens. He compares salmon farming to the battery hens of the sea. So let's look at layer chickens. The RSPCA poultry standard for caged hens, that's your typical you know, imagined battery hen, is 18 hens per square metre. And for barn raised, it's slightly less at 15 hens per square metre. And I'm sure you can see from this graphic here that 18 hens 
crammed into one square metre is far greater than Atlantic salmon stocking density. So are Atlantic salmon the battery hens of the sea? No, they're not. Now, speaking of the RSPCA, Richard again uses the attack the good guys approach in this chapter, accusing both the RSPCA and Huon Aquaculture of malfeasance and manipulation of the standard in relation to the small amount of fish that Huon grow in Macquarie Harbour, and which they and the RSPCA very clearly declare are not RSPCA approved. I don't know what Richard's trying to get to by that, but when the RSPCA and the company both say that a proportion of the production is not approved by the RSPCA, what is wrong with that? Next he describes the conditions in the cages, just over there, with the conditions faced by land farmed sheep, saying, the water in which the salmon are condemned to the most wretched of lives is a soup of shit and ammonia and urea. WC Fields allegedly said that he never drank water because fish have sex in it. They sure do. They also shit in it, piss in it, vomit in it, die in it and decay in it. So do seals, whales and every other living thing in the ocean. They've evolved to live like this, unlike land-based animals like sheep and cattle, which as Flanagan rightly said, would not tolerate swimming and breathing in a soup of shit. But think about it, if you've ever swum in the ocean, you've swum in a soup of shit. Like this, really shitty. Mmm. Mmm, shit soup. Too much salt. There are plenty of videos online which show what the conditions for the fish in the cages is actually like. Here's just one example. Flanagan says that salmon live in an aquatic torture dome, unlike these sheep, and that salmon corporations routinely accept stock losses of 10%, asking what sheep farmer would accept that kind of loss? Well, pretty much all of them, Richard. Lamb mortality rates are between 15 and 30%. Wild salmon produce about 1,800 eggs per kilo of body weight. So a six kilogram wild salmon produces about 11,000 offspring to ensure that two survive to reproduce. That's a survival rate of 0.018% or a potential 99.982% mortality rate. But it's not that bad. Wild salmon have an actual mortality rate of 95%. So with a 95% mortality rate of wild Atlantic salmon, a 30% mortality rate for farmed sheep, the 10% stock losses for farmed Tasmanian salmon is looking like a good story, not a horror story. Mmm, nothing better than the taste of a franken-melon. If you've had, ever eaten a seedless watermelon or a seedless grape, you've eaten a triploid. Triploid salmon are not chromosomally altered, as Richard Flanagan claims, but at least he hasn't claimed that they're genetically engineered, as some other opponents do. The chromosomes are not changed. It's just that instead of having two pairs of sex chromosomes in each cell, they have three. This is achieved by hitting the newly fertilised egg with high pressure at the moment of first cell division. The cell only half divides, resulting in one cell with three pairs of chromosomes instead of two cells with two pairs each. The cell then divides as normal. Check out my video on Atlantic salmon biology and life cycle for more information. Triploids are not used because they're faster growing, but because they don't mature. Used to close the gap in the year where otherwise, due to natural maturation, there'd be no fish to harvest. They are, however, as Richard Flanagan identified, more likely to suffer from deformities of the jaw. Now, Richard states that this is up to 30%, but the paper he cites for that doesn't actually say that. In fact, it doesn't provide a rate at all. Another paper, and I'll provide a link in the comments below, suggests they actually survive better, saying that 
jaw deformity, deformity occurred in up to 2% of triploid fry and 14% of triploid saltwater smolt. As the percentage should drop as they move from fry to saltwater smolt due to natural mortality at the fry stage. But from my experience, triploids don't survive as well. Triploids do have jaw deformities and are an issue. But these fish do survive in the main. In the wild, 95% of them would die. In any case, I want to pull, pull Richard up on something else that he cites. In footnote 129 of this chapter, Richard cites the Hue and Aquaculture fact sheet on its use of triploids and quotes from it. So it's clear that he's read it. So why does he lie when he says that triploids are used because they are, quote, faster growing and fatter? The fact sheet doesn't say that at all. If you're going to quote a source, Richard, then don't misrepresent it. More on that when we talk jellyfish. Lisa Ann Gershwin is an enigmatic jellyfish scientist who has lately become one of the darlings of the anti-salmon farming set in Tasmania. While I acknowledge that Dr Gershwin has been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, there seems to be something weird about her that the condition alone might not fully explain. For example, she claims quite publicly that she was sacked from first the Queen Victoria and Art Gallery Museum in Launceston and later from the CSIRO because of her autism. And there is this bizarre website called Launceston City Scandal, which I won't go into, but feel free to have a look at at your leisure. Nevertheless, Dr Gershon has received a lot of publicity about her views on the relationship between salmon farming and jellyfish. For example, this article published in 2019 by the ABC. Could fish farms be creating the problem of jellyfish. Dr Gershwin's claim is that salmon farming practices cause jellyfish blooms, which in turn negatively impact the salmon in a vicious cycle of environmental tag. She may be right, but if Richard Flanagan is citing Dr Gershwin when he says that, quote, the huge nutrient stream from salmon acts as fertiliser, stimulating the growth of zooplankton, a primary food for jellyfish, end quote, then you have to wonder. Zooplankton are microscopic animals. They are not fertilised, no more than Richard's dog is fertilised when he opens that tin of chum. Phytoplankton, microalgae, are fertilised with nutrients from salmon farms, Richard, not zooplankton. You spent all of chapter two warning us of the threat of algal blooms, and now it's tiny animal blooms instead. Really? Is this a mistake, Richard, or an alternative reality? I knew this would come in handy again. I might just inject it with this pink dye, call it salmon, and get myself a cat. In any case, we have already discussed how Richard has obviously consulted the Hewitt Aquaculture fact sheet on triploids, so it cannot be believed that he wasn't tempted to look at the one on jellyfish. And beyond the assertions by the evil spin doctors on the Hewitt Aquaculture PR team stating that, quote, there is no evidence that moon jellyfish blooms are occurring with increased frequency or severity in southeast Tasmania. The last significant moon jellyfish season prior to the 2018-19 summer was the 2012-13 summer. No instances of significant jellyfish blooms were recorded near Hewans leases in either the summer of 2019-20 or 2020-21. Richard might have at least clicked through on the link cited in this uh, fact sheet to get this research from Dr Kylie Pitt. How robust is the evidence that human activities cause jellyfish blooms? where Dr. Pitt states, we were curious about how often scientific papers claim that human activities cause sea jelly blooms and what sort of evidence authors use to support their claims. We discovered that almost half the papers published on the topic of jellyfish blooms contain statements that human activities cause jellyfish blooms, so our perception that such claims are widespread in the scientific li literature was correct. When we analyse the evidence that authors use to substantiate their claims that human activities cause jellyfish blooms, we discovered three things. 
that most authors used as evidence studies of just a couple of highly invasive species of sea jellies. An analogy would be extrapolating from studies of rats or rabbits to understand how bilbies or snow leopards might respond to human activities. Two, authors often cited correlative study to support their claims. An example might be that sea jellies were more abundant in areas polluted with nutrients. A problem with correlations is that we don't know if one observation is caused by the other, so correlative evidence needs to be interpreted cautiously. Finally, authors also frequently cited the same handful of studies to support their claims that human activities cause sea jelly blooms. The studies cited mainly contained circumstantial evidence and proposed conceptual ideas about how sea jellies might respond to human activities rather than robust evidence that human activities cause sea jelly blooms. We conclude that although human activities could enhance sea jelly populations, robust evidence is limited. We need to use rigorous experiments and study how many different species of sea jellies respond to human activities before concluding that sea jellies as a group thrive in degraded ocean ecosystems. And for all that, the enigmatic Dr. Lisa Ann Gershwin is rolled out by the anti-salmon farming warriors as their Joan of Arc. When running as a candidate for the, for the recent Tasmanian election, however, the platforms were mental health, disabilities, housing and communities. Not a single mention of jellyfish or any opposition to salmon farming. If I was in her electorate, I might well have voted for her. If you look carefully on these rocks, you might, if you lived in an alternative reality, spot a walrus. While not as rare as seeing a walrus, the long-nosed fur seal is indeed a rare species in Tasmania. Only 4,000 of them reside here. Until recently, it was known as the New Zealand fur seal. Does that give you an idea why it might be so rare here? But rather than focus on the more common and still threatened Australian fur seal, Richard singles out the long-nosed fur seal. The Australian fur seal pop population was destroyed in the first years of European settlement with almost 400,000 seals of the estimated population of 750,000 slaughtered between 1800 and 1807 alone. The population is now recovered to around 80,000. With this horrendous slaughter of the Australian fur seal a historical reality, why does Richard Flanagan have to go one further and invoke the rarely encountered long-nosed fur seal to make his point? I think this goes to the whole modus operandi of Richard's writing. Reality for Richard, no matter how horrifying or confronting, is not enough for him. Only fiction, a constructed world of his own, can take reality to a place where Richard is central, where he controls it, literally controls the narrative. Let's look at his body of work. Wanting an imagination of Governor Sir John Franklin's infatuation with Aboriginal girl Mathinna. First person, an imagination of Richard's own writing of the autobiography of John Friedrich. The narrow road to the deep north, his father's story. And while I don't have a cover of it, because it's very hard to get, that biography of John Friedrich, the first book that Richard had to his name, and paradoxically, the only other factual book that he attempted to write, but was forced by circumstances to fictionalise. All his works are not based on a true story types of tales. They're far more than that. They're fictionalised fantasies of something that has a tenuous link to reality. His book, a prize-winning novel, The Narrow Road to the Deep North, his father's story, his own story. Well, my father's story is coming up in chapter seven. My mother's story finished right here. 
So let's consider this extract from first person, where the narrator Kiff, Flanagan's fictional version of himself, says of the mysterious Ziggy Heidel, quote, what he lacked in facts, he made up with an understated conviction, and what he lacked in conviction, he made up for with facts, albeit mostly invented, and rendered all the more plausible because they were so lightly thrown up from an unexpected angle. Kiff eventually becomes like Ziggy, inventing the story of the con man's life. Kiff, as I said, is Richard Flanagan's fictionalised version of himself, writing the biography of John Friedrich. Did the mental corruption of working with Friedrich corrupt Flanagan such that he could never be truthful, even with himself again? If you've enjoyed or hated this video, share it. Next week, chapter five. Yeah. And hopefully a little bit shorter. And hopefully some more voices other than my own. Other than my own. If you've enjoyed the literary analysis, stay tuned for part 4B, which goes into a little bit more detail, particularly around Flanagan's first person.